Great. Hi, welcome everyone. We're going to give folks just another minute or so to get on and then we'll start promptly at the top of the hour. As you're joining, if you want to go ahead and head over to the chat and introduce yourself, tell us where you're calling from. I think we're going to have a large group today. I'm excited to see, excited you're all here, excited to see where you're calling from. Great. Um, well, welcome again, and thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Rihanna Putnam, and I'm the Community Engagement Specialist for the Citizen Science Association. I have a few slides about the CSA and some housekeeping notes, and then I'll turn it over to our moderator, Nora Conlin, to tell us more about the event and speakers. As I'm sharing, um, if you could go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat, tell us where you're calling from, or if you're affiliated with a project, we're excited to get to know you all. So the Citizen Science Association is a member-driven organization that connects people from a wide range of experiences around a shared purpose of advancing knowledge through research and monitoring done by, for, and with members of the public. Our efforts are concentrated into a biennial conference and virtual event series, a peer-reviewed journal, and member services such as our working groups, online networking, and webinars like these. Our membership represents a multidisciplinary and multidimensional nature of the field and includes practitioners, researchers, educators, and community leaders, and more. From all of our members, we hear that CSA is a community to call home, a place where you'll be welcomed and encouraged to engage in cross-cutting conversations that you won't find in any other organization. We just launched a new engagement site called CSA Connect, pictured here, to facilitate more networking and connections for CSA members and invited guests. This fall, we'll be diving deeper into topics important to this field through guided conversations on CSA Connect and beyond. Consider becoming a CSA member and join the conversation. We know you have something valuable to share. Many of these conversations are led by our working groups. CSA has nine working groups that explore cross-cutting issues like data and metadata, evaluation, ethics, and more. If data quality is something you'd like to explore more, consider joining us in October as our data and metadata group leads discussions on CSA Connect and hosts an event on the data quality resource compendium that the group put together. This webinar will be recorded and uploaded to a YouTube playlist later this week. We have a growing number of webinar recordings available there on a variety of topics. You can find them on our YouTube page linked on our website. All of our webinars are led by experts in the field whose opinions may or may not reflect the association as a whole. CSA greatly appreciates the time and contributions of speakers volunteering to take part in webinars and the questions and inputs from attendees. This webinar is hosted in collaboration with the Association of Public Health Laboratories and the US Environmental Protection Agency. A special thanks to Sarah Wright at APHL for helping coordinate this event. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Nora Conlin of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to tell us more about the event and introduce our speakers. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's lovely to have you all join us today. Um, as uh, Rihanna said, I'm Nora Conlin, and I'm a quality assurance chemist from uh, the Environmental Protection Agency in Region 1, which is in New England. I'd like to thank you all for joining us for this webinar, Make Your Citizen Science Project Count Strategies to Produce Quality Data. Next slide. So uh, we have a great group of speakers for you today. Jill Carr, Brian Maggie, Sergio Ruiz Cordova, and Dirk Felton. And they will give us four different perspectives on strategies citizen science groups can use to produce quality data, particularly in collaboration with government agencies. So the way this is going to work today, we're going to have four brief presentations uh, from this wide variety of uh, perspectives, and then we will move to a facilitated uh, panel. And so I have some questions to start with, but I'll also be uh, looking for questions from you. Um, if you, on the Zoom, you'll see that there's a question and answer box at the bottom. So if you could please type your questions in there, we'll monitor those and uh, weave them into the seminar if we have time and we'll follow up with questions that don't get answered. All right, so why are we doing this? 
Well, we all know that the that there's huge power to citizen science. And that's because there's a whole world of scientific observations to be made out there. But we know for a fact, government scientists, professional scientists can't make them all. And on top of that, we don't always know what's important to you. So we need this partnership between government and uh, others to uh, really address uh, public and environmental health issues. Next slide, please. So what are the barriers to using citizen science? Uh, and I, you can group them as the unknowns. When getting your data used, you need to answer the who, what, where, when, and how data were collected. And we think we have some, some help to address those barriers. Next slide. So the the way to uh, overcome those barriers comes from planning and documentation because we want data of known and documented quality. Next slide, please. To that end, EPA has developed uh, this tool, the Citizen Science Quality Assurance Handbook, which includes the handbook, examples, and templates. And in the right corner, you can see where these live on our website. Next slide, please. And in collaboration with APHL, a whole new set of, of tools have been uh, put into the toolbox. So there are six videos explaining uh, details about the QA handbook and how to plan your projects, fact sheets that help you step through things to think about for producing quality data. This webinar is another uh, tool in the toolbox. Next slide. And there's a guidance document, uh, as well as we did a, a webinar with government agencies. So again, this, this going both ways between citizen groups and government, and you can see the website there. So we're pretty excited about these things and they are currently available. So with that, we're ready to start our talks and uh, our first speaker will be Jill Carr who will provide a brief overview of some longstanding impactful projects that the Massachusetts-based National Estuary Pro Partnership has developed with citizen science groups. Jill? That's great, thank you. Um, let me just confirm, you can hear me okay? Sure can. I'm gonna assume that's a yes. Okay, great, thanks. Hi everyone, I'm Jill Carr. I'm the Coastal Data Scientist at Mass Bay's National Estuary Partnership. We are an EPA designated national estuary program and we're tasked with tracking the status of habitats and water quality along 1100 miles of coastline in Massachusetts. To study conditions and promote improvements where necessary, we work closely with dozens of community-based science groups and monitoring groups, as well as government entities like EPA and MassDEP to build collaborations and share data. Today, I'm gonna to highlight two case studies where community-based groups we work with improved local conditions by coordinating with agencies and collecting high quality data under an approved Quality Assurance Project Plan or QAP. Next slide, please. The first case study I'll highlight is one of seagrass loss in Duxbury, Massachusetts. Seagrass is a marine meadow forming plant that provides critical fisheries habitat and shoreline protection. It was once expansive in Duxbury, but in 2014, boaters and fishers reported severe losses at some of their favorite spots. They brought the concerns to the local watershed group, the North and South Rivers Watershed Association, as well as to the state's Division of Marine Fisheries. Their concerns prompted DMF to pursue habitat mapping, which confirmed significant losses, estimated at half of the habitat lost over 20, over 20 years. A working group began meeting to identify causes and explore existing data sets. Next. The partnership formed between the watershed group and the agencies identified the need for more detailed and more frequent habitat surveys. And the partnership collaborated on the development of a novel monitoring protocol that utilizes community scientists to track seagrass presence and condition. And it included a cool new web app for data collection. The program was handed over entirely to the watershed group. And now with an EPA approved QAP in hand, annual surveys continue into their fourth year and new habitat losses continue to be documented now much more quantifiably than ever before. 
Because quality control measures are put in place to ensure data reliability, the survey results can be integrated into DEP water body assessments and also in, are now informing restoration plans. And while not fully a, su a success story given the magnitude of habitat loss, this birth of a new monitoring plan and a new form of stewardship among local residents is a great success. Next. The second case study is in the Charles River, which is an icon of Boston, um, though it hasn't always been a picturesque one. It was known as the infamous Dirty Water from the Standell song in the 1960s. The Charles was plagued by pollution as it flowed through 23 different communities on its way to Boston Harbor. The Charles River Watershed Association was founded in 1965 and they were the first to routinely sample the river. They formalized their water quality program with an approved QAP in 1995. Their volunteer based team found severe point source sewage contamination and they brought their findings to regulators. Their data motivated the development of a state sewage control plan to cut combined sewer overflows into the river and also contributed to EPA exercising consent orders on 10 different communities to eliminate point source discharges. This was all based on their data. At the same time, EPA issued its first report card for the Charles, also based entirely on their data, the watershed group's data. Grade was a D, and by the mid 2000s, thanks to their hard work and advocacy, the Watershed Association reported major sewage reductions and improving water quality. They expanded their program to also lead nutrient TMDL studies for the state for DEP. Next. Now, decades after that D grade, the Watershed Association has conducted countless water quality, fisheries, and habitat improvement projects and has boasted A's and B's in their report cards since 2013. A robust program, still adhering strictly to an approved QAP, continues to contribute data to DEP's water body assessments. Their data are directly responsible for many listings and delistings for impairments like chronic aquatic toxicity, nutrients, eutrophication, temperature, fish passage barriers, and invasive plants. The Charles River Watershed Association's monitoring program serves as a model across the region, and their adherence to an approved QAP and collaboration with government aid entities truly placed their high quality data at the center stage of decision making in the Charles River. Next. Now these highlighted case studies surely had their share of challenges in developing their QAPs as many groups do. The time consuming process of writing the document itself and then the back and forth with agencies in the approval process, it can feel really defeating and it can be a real barrier to QAP completion. And for that reason, MassBase has dedicated staff and developed tools to support the many groups in our region. One such tool was recently launched a couple of weeks ago is AquaQAP. This is a web-based wizard-like tool that guides project planning and generates water quality and benthic sampling quaps for freshwater, estuarine, and marine waters. AquaQuap brings users through a series of forms to collect project information, which it formats into a quap document, along with standard boilerplate quap language. And as long as the document is adhered to and not significantly altered, it's considered pre-approved by MassDEP and deemed acceptable by EPA. The tool's features draw from the EPA handbook, as well as from extensive input from MassDEP and EPA Region 1 staff, as well as a stakeholder testing group we convened. The tool is free and available to all at aquaquap.com. You're free to, to check it out and use it as much as you like, though I should caution it is geared toward Massachusetts water quality standards. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, next, we have Brian Meggy, who will summarize how Clean Air NC has produced air quality data that was successfully used for public health decision making. Brian? Thanks, Nora. Uh, can you hear me okay? Make sure? Yes, I can. Okay. Well, thanks for uh, providing some time and space for this discussion. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, Clean Air North Carolina or Clean Air NC and uh, the partnerships that have stretched from this nonprofit group to my institution, University of North Carolina at Charlotte, and a number of other partners that are listed at the bottom. And by no means is that list exhaustive. I just wanted to at least provide some recognition of how many partnerships are at work in order to make this quality assured project uh, successful and produce uh, results that um, some, of the, some of the results that I'll highlight here in the, in the case studies. We'll look at. 
Oh, next slide, sorry. So good news uh, is in the big picture, air quality has improved in North Carolina where we are. And uh, this is a picture of air quality index as a function of time uh, for ozone. And it's gone from yellow, orange, and red days down to uh, green, mostly green and yellow days. Of course, we still have some problems. Next slide, please. And the same is true for particle pollution or PM 2.5. And this is the big picture. But the bad news is that regulated air pollutants are not the only concern, as I've tried to highlight there in the, on the slide. First of all, there's the lived experience of communities, and we can think of this as our neighborhood uh, experience of air pollution. And it may be very different than the regional scale um, that the EPA and the Clean Air Act are, are regulating. There's a potential lack of monitoring at hyper local scales that, uh, that, that play into the lived experience with respect to air pollution. And there are also unregulated or less regulated air pollutants that may be of concern to different communities. And that introduces all sorts of questions about how do we even uh, undertake questions of, of citizen science that leads to action. And then finally, underneath all that is the more systemic questions that are related to environmental justice, environmental racism, uh, associated with those lived experiences and the marginalized communities that are often experiencing those. Uh, next slide, please. So the good news uh, is that, at least here in North Carolina, we have a number of successes that stem from, again, Clean Air and Seas uh, efforts. And one is that we have now a regulatory PM 2.5 monitor within a community that has historically been marginalized in uh, Northwest Charlotte. And that is the, you know, the technical side is, of course, the picture of the monitor. But I want to really emphasize that I threw pictures on here of the people and the various processes that, un that had to unfold and, and, and uh, come together in order for this monitor to be deployed. It wasn't simply that it had to happen. It was a conversation that started months and months before this could, could ever be undertaken. And that partnership was uh, a very important one that led to a, an immediate success. Uh, next slide, please. Underneath Part of that was the technical side. This is back to the quality assurance kind of theme of our webinar. And this brings me to my own expertise in air quality and, and climate science. And part of my expertise and my partnership with Clean Air NC is promoting the development of a low cost monitoring network all across North Carolina. And I tried to highlight this with this simple map, but this uh, again comes back to relationship building. It's not just me going around the uh, state and trying to deploy monitors. It actually required this uh, long-term relationship building with Clean Air NC, with their staff, and with partners that in Clean Air NC had with respect to community leaders and even state agencies and regulatory groups. And then the technical side almost seems easy by comparison. Next slide, please to take advantage of what we, what the work we've done over the last three or four years, we, um, part of the technical quality assurance on my side was to make sure we had co-located sensors with respect to the regulatory monitors. And so I tried to picture that here with a, um, what, we, what we call the citizen science station in Charlotte. And this only happened because of the partnership with the regulatory agency in our county, Mecklenburg County. And a credit goes to them to have station deployed outside of their uh, main regulatory station here in the big city of Charlotte so that we could deploy low-cost monitors regularly and manage them and, and, uh, and get this co-located data. So we're doing this in Charlotte and in Winston-Salem, two cities in North Carolina, and we've got now 30,000 hours of co-located data to compare uh, the low-cost monitors to the regulatory monitors. Next slide, please. And what it looks like in terms of the technical information, remember I'm a scientist, is, is that we have a, um, the darker purple on the top graph there shows how the low cost sensor data now is in better agreement with the regulatory sensor data that's in the black compared to what it was before it was corrected after this hour, you know, thousands of hours of co-located data was collected. And so part of this is a scientific enterprise, there's a research aspect, but an important success with respect to quality assurance leading to action is that our data informs uh, the EPA vetted visual at fire.airnow.gov that many of you are probably familiar with. And so Clean Air NC's network of low cost sensors combined with UNC Charlotte and my efforts to bring this technical aspect to it and the quality assurance leads to not only peer reviewed publications, but a data assurance and better 
uh, a better situated citizen science projects and, and science to action type of statements. Next slide, please. And I just want to finish with, again, photos of the fact that these are there are people behind all these and there are lots of different dimensions to citizen science that extend way beyond data and, and, and it is inspire projects that include art up in the top right and the top bottom left and, and they include really uh, community organizing relationships that allow for action to happen, such as the monitor being deployed in a certain location in Charlotte. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. And as a reminder, I've had a, a couple of people have started adding questions to the Q&A box. Feel free to do that as uh, the rest of the presentations are provided. So uh, next up, we have Sergio Ruiz Cordova, who will highlight how the Alabama Water Watch has worked with the state of Alabama and Mexico to develop a strong surface water quality monitoring program. Sergio. Uh, thank you and um, welcome everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to you know, share the Alabama Water Watch uh, experience with you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, initially, I was given uh, some of these uh, questions to answer, and I have a kind of a short answer for each one of them, and then hopefully I can I have time to go uh, into a little bit more detail. You know, but what um, what question was Alabama Water Watch trying to answer? You know, and or problem to solve? And to that one, I could say that. Uh, in the early 90s and probably before, Alabama was in the last place in what is considered an environmental index or environmental awareness. So basically, Alabama Water Watch was trying to get Alabama out of that last place and hopefully get better in that, in that area. And we were going to try to do it through engaging citizens in environmental stewardship through community-based water monitoring. Um, how to uh, identify potential users was uh, basically, you know, the, the, we work from the beginning with the State uh, Agency for Environmental Management and uh, through in, uh, EPA Region 4. So we have been always trying to generate credible, uh, usable data for uh, these two agencies. and. Um, I, I uh, elaborate on, you know, of course, the you know educational part for all the the monitors. Um, the tools and strat strategies that we use, uh, basically, we use uh, EPA templates. You know, uh, always, you know, if the data hopefully used by them is the best way is to follow their templates, and we have been using it from the beginning. We try to validate low cost, simple methods that can produce reliable, credible, you know, uh, results, and of course, we do the side-by-side -side testing to, to get those methods to be good. Um, and uh, finally, you know, how we, um, the impact, uh, I will talk about that uh, in, in a minute, but basically the data is submitted to, to the state agency on a regular basis and, and is used by them. Next slide, please. So why uh, did Alabama Water Watch start? As I mentioned, you know, we were down in the, in the bottom. We had the opportunity, at, um, you know, in, in, Maybe uh, in the early 90s, that you know the Clean Water Act opened up this section uh, 319 to you know uh, expand um, education for non-point non source pollution. So we were able to apply for some of that funding, and we you know started you know from the beginning uh, getting a quality assurance plan, and, and data started coming. And um, as, as now, of course, you know uh, with technology, we try to keep up and um, try to get all our our information to the public uh, via the internet. Uh, since uh, 2013, we are uh, in the based in the Harvard University Water Resources Center, and we uh, receive support of the you know uh, extension um, service and the Ag Experiment Station. Uh, but in addition, of course, uh, uh, Alabama had uh, a lot of other challenges and uh, 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 great things over here. Uh, most of you may know, you know Alabama is a hotspot for biodiversity. We have a lot of water resources, but uh, we have to take care of them. So the best thing it would be, you know, engaging citizens to take care of these great resources. Next slide, please. 
Uh, and this is just uh, a, a, an image of how we 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 try to keep that data credible, and is a lot of uh, steps of uh, quality assurance. You know that uh, start from you know the beginning with the uh, uh, recruiting and and uh, training of the citizen monitors. Uh, the uh, ultimate goal is to, of course, have uh, well-trained uh, monitors that are going to produce very good data that it can be used you know for for different uh, uh, purposes so um, as in you know goal of alabama water watch it will be basically educating training and empowering citizens to uh, monitor and use the data to improve water quality uh, actually, I have a, a quote over here from, you know, our state agency, you know, as, as they receive the data on a regular basis, they, they, they say something uh, in this in these words, ADEM appreciates the work of uh, Alabama Water Watch and the extensive water quality database that it has developed through a nationally recognized citizen monitoring program. The data are readily available and provide important trend information about many water bodies in Alabama. The information in the database helps ADEM identify where additional agency monitoring resources are needed to identify potential, potential sources and causes of water quality impairment. So uh, is um, what we have been you know, doing, trying to you know, keep that uh, quality of the data so it can be used by our agency. Next slide, please. Uh, this uh, is related to the uh, um, strategies. You know, as I mentioned, we follow the EPA uh, templates, but uh, for citizens, of course, we had to try to, you know, find something that it was doable and meaningful. Um, we uh, look for uh, techniques that you know can be uh, done uh, with you know relatively uh, easy training and they provide good results and the the goal is to get these long term you know uh, trends uh, as in the, the early uh, earlier uh, slide a lot of the the QA goes in every step from the monitoring, from the selecting the site, you know, from the every test, you know, they have to, you know, check their uh, techniques, they have to check the reagents, and uh, it goes all the way to sending the, the data to us. And uh, it has worked pretty good, pretty good. Uh, we can, you know, we are very, very helpful, uh, very, very um, happy. Next slide, please. To show some of the accomplishments and the impact that we have had. Uh, next one, please. Um, we have divided the impacts of what I watch uh, as a citizen group into these three big categories, environmental education, advocacy, and water policy, and restoration and protection. And there are many examples of this in, in our website. You can go and check it out. But um, some that I can you know, briefly mention is that uh, uh, since the beginning, you know, uh, earlier this year, we reached a, a big milestone of getting 100,000 world quality records that uh, are available to the public, uh, to anybody. Uh, and um, through education, we have been able to reach thousands of, of students uh, doing this type of activities and becoming hopefully better uh, stewards of their, um, of their watersheds and their water bodies. Uh, through you know advocacy, you, we have you know several uh, water bodies that have been upgraded in their use classifications, and is basically the effort of uh, these groups of citizens that you know have been collecting data for years, and um, have you know been able to use the data to uh, have more protection for their water bodies. And uh, beyond Alabama, uh, we have been able to, you know, uh, be an example for other states and for other countries. Uh, one that I can mention briefly is uh, Mexico. Uh, we got there about 15 years ago. And uh, after all that time, finally, uh, now the Federal Commission of Water in Mexico is adopting citizen science to be part of their, you know, nationwide monitoring. So it's something that, you know, we really uh, hope that is a model for other countries too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sergio. Um, and so for our last quick talk, 
uh, we have Dirk Felton, who will provide the perspective of how a government agency worked closely with citizen science, scientists to produce the data that were used to justify the closure of the Tonawanda Coke manufacturing facility. Dirk? Yeah, thanks. And uh, that's just one of my uh, topics today. Um, I did want to say quickly that I'm in the Division of Air Resources and the DEC has other divisions, including water, and they've had citizen science programs going for, I think, 30 plus years to measure lake water quality. And uh, for air pollution, um, we've had a couple of great experiences. Uh, Randy Walker, who I just want to mention, uh, is the one who came up with our community air screen program, and she's on vacation this week, so I'm filling in. I'm uh, basically the supervisor of our environmental lab in the monitoring bureau. Next slide. Um, and back in 2005, people uh, like to, to hear this story because it was so successful. Um, the Bucket Brigade did take some samples and found some high levels of benzene uh, outside of Tonawanda. Um, we actually went back and verified their findings with our TO-15 uh, canisters. Um, we used that information to help win a uh, a competitive community assessment grant from EPA. And we were able to uh, set up a monitoring study in Tonawanda using those uh, competitive grant funds. Um, lots of people wanted uh, sampling. So we set up uh, in 2013, a community air screen program. And that allowed us to use our existing air toxics QAP, uh, but to expand it to citizen scientists who wanted to take samples in their neighborhood. So we advertised the plan, we designed the application form to be very simple, but include all of the quality assurance that is necessary. We even had our regional engineers who are familiar with where sources are and what emissions uh, those uh, sources tend to emit, uh, come up with uh, re reasonable target compounds for those uh, applications. Next slide. So, by designing the program from the ground up, we were able to include quality assurance in all of the forms and paperwork. So the application uh, had a place to just paste in a Google map. Um, we encouraged people to attach pictures, um, information about, you know, don't contaminate samples, sample integrity, training. Uh, we created a YouTube video for how to collect the sample. Um, we have a brochure that you could stick in your pocket so that when you're at the monitoring location that your community group has selected, you won't forget a step because you've got that handy uh, uh, pamphlet. Um, all of this really helped us collect terrific samples. Uh, we didn't have any trouble. Uh, in fact, we had an eighth grade class uh, and they were absolutely fabulous. Uh, they filled out every single form perfectly. Next one. Uh, this is just a quick <laughs> view of our, uh, this is a three part uh, foldable form that you can stick in your pocket just to remind people how to take a sample. And it's the kind of thing we did just to make sure things weren't forgotten along the way. And it really did help us to collect uh, very good samples. Next one. So the results, um, the air screen reports, I think we did 18 or so different studies um, when we get the results back from our laboratory, we don't just hand them to the community. We end up writing a very long report that includes um, the toxicity of each of these compounds, where the likely sources are, uh, what the uh, normal range for these compounds are, uh, what the comparison is with other parts of the state, so that when people get these results, they really get an understanding of what is in their air, not just what the numbers are. Um, it taught us a lot about risk communication. Um, you know, we have a monitor on the top of Whiteface Mountain and we find benzene there. So it, it's something you have to explain to people, you're not gonna get a zero, you're gonna get a number. The question is, is that number something to be concerned about? So going back to Tonawanda Coke, uh, we did start a study uh, with that competitive uh, funding from the EPA. And after quite a few years of monitoring, it led to enforcement action, uh, a jail term <laughs> for environmental officer and the closure of Tonawanda Coke. And the benzene levels for that community certainly did 
uh, drop down to uh, reasonable levels, uh, even lower than what are shown in the plot there. Next one. So um, one thing that we do a lot of, uh, because we are a regulatory agency and we run uh, federal reference and equivalent methods, um, people like to ask us to provide comparison data or locations where they can test their uh, sensors. And we've been doing a lot of that. Uh, we test purple errors. We come up with our own algorithms for rural and urban areas. Uh, the New York City Community Air Survey is a, a very uh, big program in the city, and we compare data continually with that. Um, Beacon is out of Berkeley, and we have several sites in New York City uh, looking at source regions. Acoma uses uh, cars to drive around and collect hyperlocal data, and they like to compare their data to ours so they can normalize the background. That helps them get uh, faster at what the differences are between neighborhoods. So we've found ourselves you know, helping in citizen scientists mostly as a comparison rather than as an actually going out in the field. Um, but that's likely to change. New York has a climate uh, a legislation that is going to be uh, encouraging four or five uh, major studies coming up in the next few years. So we're likely to be doing more of that going forward. Thank you. Oh, the next slide does have uh, resources, including uh, links to the uh, the videos if anyone's interested, and the actual community air screen reports are available as well. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dirk. Um, and now it's time for all of our speakers to turn on their cameras, please. Um, I want to thank. Uh, Dirk, Jill, Brian, and Sergio for their presentations, which were so great. And to see the outcomes that happen from these data collection activities is inspiring. Um, so at this point, we're gonna start our uh, facilitated panel discussion. And I've been looking at the thread of, of questions. So I'm gonna start with a, a pre-prepared question. And then from there, uh, I'm gonna see if we can uh, do a couple of group things from the questions that have come. So I want to start with what advice would you have for other groups wanting to achieve this same impact in the area you've worked on? So advice. And I will start with Jill. Thanks, Nora. Yeah, my biggest piece of, of advice would be to make contact early and, and often um, with the others in your area. So reach out to the other nearby watershed groups or um, environmental groups who might have overlapping interests with you. Reach out to the state agencies and your local EPA regional office. Um, these are the groups that might have a, a, a huge perspective, historic perspective about data gaps that might exist in your area. I think that's a really great place to start when you're formulating your project and can help you hone in on exactly what you want to address. Thank you. All right, now I'll, I'll ask the same question of Brian. I'm gonna ask it of all of you, so just be ready. Thanks, Nora. Uh, it, I, I totally agree with Jill. Um, and I, I'll just say that I think without those relationships in place, you know, you, you have to, there has to be a synergy underway to take advantage of opportunities that arise really quickly. I mean, we can think of grant, you know, like one really intimidating aspect of citizen science is, is maybe trying to find funding to support uh, the community organ organizations that are, are really grassroots in a lot of ways, right? It's, uh, and, and partnering with academic institutions where ac the academy, you know, is looking the reward structure in the academy is to support publication and scientific research that reaches out to communities. Sometimes academics aren't real well situated to actually do that, but they're interested. And so finding that finding those opportunities requires synergy and that synergy requires time and effort way ahead of time. Don't be afraid to reach out to people. Thank you. All right, next, Sergio, what's your piece of advice? Uh, um... With water monitoring, uh, there is sometimes a misconception that just is a transfer of technology. And if you got the kit, you know, uh, and uh, miracles are going to happen. Uh, my advice is that 
basically as a as a citizen group you have to you know get a, a relationship that sometimes goes beyond like a, a project if this is started with a project okay. so is i mean we have monitors that they have been testing for 25 years you know, and they become so intimate with their water body i mean they know it you know very well and and that's i think what uh, sometimes yes is good to you know uh, keep in mind the, the, the QA and, you know, all the quality, whatever, but, um, uh, you know, citizens can be the best scientists you know, because they are basically monitoring their water and is where their kids swim or their grandkids swim and they want to know the quality of that water. So they want to get good data. So, uh, I think is uh, I usually you know in, in our workshops I tell the people you know I mean you don't have to come here to learn how to you know do the you know pH testing of the of test you can you can learn that reading the instructions you know it's basically the why are you doing it what is more important they they love what they do don't they so um and now Dirk what do you what will you add in terms of advice especially since you're from the government side right well. The, the first thing is to call the government. And one of the reasons is uh, one, we often know of sources that might be emitting the compound those people are concerned about. And depending on whether the process is well controlled, uh, say it's a sewage treatment plant, I mean, they can have ups and downs in their operation and we're not necessarily gonna know that. Some of these sources aren't well geared towards continuous emission monitoring. So it's often citizens are the first uh, people to notice a problem. So, you know, let us know about issues um, and we might suggest, you know, what, where to monitor and what time of day when the atmospheric conditions are appropriate for getting higher concentrations. Um, and we might want to go out and monitor ourselves if, if we know there are complaints in a certain area. Thank you. Um, so now I'm going to switch a little bit and I want to um, assure people that we are collecting all the questions. So if we don't get to, to address it during this, there will be follow up and we'll try and, and answer, especially for very specific questions. But I'm going to go, I have two groups of things that I'm going to, um, so the first one I'm going to do is how you found or ways to find the resources for documenting your your projects and the quality of your project. What were the um, strategies that you used to do that? Does that make sense? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go backwards. Dirk, I'm going to start with you. Uh, I'm actually a very big fan of using algorithms. So co-locating things like the purple air, and then using equations to normalize the data to a reference method. And simply put, that's basically what the EPA is doing in the fire and smoke map. Um, we've been encouraging people to use purple airs if they have wood smoke complaints in their neighborhoods, and it's been working fairly well, but we don't encourage people to just rely on raw data coming out of these sensors. You know, go ahead and massage the data to normalize it to something that is traceable to a reference method if you can. And does New York State post on their website resources to do that type of stuff? Um, we, we operate a couple of those sensors and we'll provide information to folks. Um, we haven't loaned out purple airs, but we could. Um, we only have a few of them. Um, EPA Region 2 is developing a little sensor library that they can loan things out um, I know New Jersey is doing that as well. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, Sergio, you mentioned about using templates uh, from EPA. How did you get those? Well, uh, again, since we work with, uh, uh, you know, you, some, sometimes, you know, uh, grants, you know, through ADM or through Gulf of Mexico program, uh, if it's EPA project, we have to have a quality assurance plan. And uh, I just go to the website and check out. Uh, fortunately, now it's getting better than <laughs> the last four years. But uh, yeah, uh, having all those templates help to, you know, guide you where to go. And uh, I don't know if, if it's here, but uh, as, you know, 
uh, working with them, uh, they um, aid them, the state agency. They have, you know, expanded to go to, you know, other other uh, areas in the state, and uh, offer, you know, the. Um, funding to do you know watershed management plans or uh, different projects of you know stewardship and usually we are part of those of those plans in those programs one one you know a uh, couple of years ago it was through u.s forest service there are you know national forests in alabama they didn't have enough people to do their testing uh, or monitoring so uh, they say you know there is this citizen science fund you want to apply and we apply and now we have monitoring groups going on in every of the uh, national forests in Alabama. Oh, great. Um, all right, Brian, and um, you really talked a lot about the people that are impacted by the work that is being done. So how, how do you connect them to the quality aspects or the, the planning part of uh, doing these this type of work? Well, yeah, I think I think uh, Dirk mentioned purple air devices, and I see a little bit of chatter in the Q and A about these as well. And these low cost devices have, you know, they've, they've revolutionized. I think the access to at least air quality data. Um, that's of course my my realm, not water quality. And I think having a tool that can automatically manage the data from the standpoint of a, as a scientist, or from a citizen scientist, or a community leader. In other words, the data goes somewhere where it's stored in pretty much like an Excel file and, and you can access the data that way. That's, that's step one is having somebody else manage that or design something. That's part of usually like the quality assurance project plan is, is what to do with the data. But if that aspect is removed, it's a huge burden that's lifted. So Purple Air, I mean, a credit to them as a company. I'm not a stockholder, so I'm just speaking as a scientist, but I think it's a credit to them as a company to recognize how big a burden they've lifted by providing access to automated data management and, and then strategizing from that standpoint what to do with all that data and is becomes one of the co-location and how to handle that kind of data and you know, back to what Dirk said. So uh, I'll go to the data management side on that same side of the questions. Thank you. Yeah, the, the where it's going and planning for where it's going when you start makes such a big difference. And Jill, I'm, you presented uh, a tool, but do you want to talk some more about how how uh, you provide resources to citizen groups to do that documentation? Sure. Um, prior to the tool going online, <clears throat> groups were largely trying to use EPA templates um, that are posted online or templates that are provided by our local DEP. Um, but it can still be very challenging to fill those out. So usually at Mass Bays, we would connect um, a kind of a newer starting up watershed group with um, you know, a veteran group that could take them on as somewhat of mentors. They would share their existing approved co-ops with this newer group and sort of help guide them, show them you know, what, what level of detail needs to be included and who the players are that need to give you approval. And connecting those, those folks with each other just made everyone's um, lives easier and allowed for collaboration as well. In some cases, some of those groups, if they were adjacent water bodies, would later team up and, and collaborate on projects together. Thank you. Um, so I'm trying to think if this is the right time to do this, but we had some very technical questions on uh, things like audits, field audits, and do any of you have the, well, some of you are government, um, the experience on, on the specific verification steps that might uh, enhance the usability of your, of your data, and have you been able to partner to, to make that happen? And especially on the technical side, that's this question. Uh, and I'm going to let someone choose to speak. Dirk, your uh, mic is on. Yeah, I'm happy to, to speak up on this one. Um, usually audits are, are there to prove that your equipment is working over time. When you initially deploy something, you, you calibrate it or you get it from the factory calibrated and it should be working. Um, the audit is required every quarter, every month, depending on what it is, every two weeks so that you can be sure that it's still working properly. 
Um, if you don't have the ability to calibrate something like a purple air, you can rotate a co-location around or swap it out to make sure that you're still getting good data from that location. So there are other strategies besides audits that you can use to make sure your lower cost sensors are working properly over time. The buddy system works too. And you look at a neighborhood versus of monitors, you kind of get a feel over time for how they relate to each other. And if one is sticking out, then go ahead and co-locate with that one. And make sure your data is still good. I kind of love that because there was a question too about long-term monitoring projects, whatever the type of uh, uh, media is being uh, observed and having buddy, having the handoff, having the, the history is so uh, important. So who else would like to talk to this uh, technical QA part and piece? I can, I mean, I can, I'll just echo again what Dirk said. I think part of, you know, part of that discussion is, is finding those partners within, you know, regulatory agencies, if they have the, the capacity for, for that depends on the, it depends on where you are in the country. Um, but academic institutions are another place where you can often find people that are interested in doing this kind of data work as a part of their uh, overall publication um, pathway towards, uh, towards a scientific career and that publication pathway very much could include the community members as a part of that. And as much as they want to get into the technical weeds, right? Or it could do simply be the that the end product is really the most important piece for a conversation to continue. So I think, I think there's a lot of different ways you could you could explore that. And it depends on the community member, it depends on the location of the country. Thank you. Sergio? Yeah, I, I can add on the on the water side, and I just saw another uh, question popping up there about the low cost uh, quality tools. We have been uh, kind of you know, promoting you know things that need very little calibration, you know, and, and we have examples. We have a group that got a bunch of money down on the coast, and they bought these you know fancy than the you know, but they didn't know they had to calibrate them, you know. So you know, after about six months, I think they threw them away, you know, <laughs> because it's. Uh, uh, it's, it's another step that you have, you know, uh, and I understand, you know, in, in other types of monitoring, you know, you may need that type of equipment, but uh, we still do the old, you know, Winkler method that you have to, you know, mix your, your chemicals and it's relatively easy. Actually, they need that method to calibrate the, the digital <laughs> meters. So it's a lot easier using th this type of, of uh, um, methodology that, that we have been promoting. Um, working again with the with the um, agencies or with the state and government. I mean, the, that example in Mexico is amazing because yes, the citizen went to the you know the lab of the uh, Federal Commission of Water and they were running this the tests side by side there. You know, the government with the standard methods and over here with the you know water watch kit and the results came you know pretty good. That's so that's the reason they are pretty happy about you know uh, adopting in this type of monitoring. Thank you. And Jill, would you like to uh, offer something on this? You're going to have to give me a specific question because I was busy in the Q&A writing some responses. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, there's all these things going on. So, but um, the technical aspects of uh, quality, um, what what steps have been taken and, and what has helped get that data used. Um, thinking about auditing, thinking about calibrations, thinking about things along those lines. Yes, yeah, that um, that's usually laid out very clearly in, in the QAP documentation. And in my experience, it's something that's been very important to the agencies that are reviewing and approving these QAPs is what are the actual steps you're going to take and for water samples and perhaps air sampling, some number of duplicate data. So, uh, you know, a duplicate sample that goes through the exact same analysis to ensure, um, you know, the, the sampling was co co collected properly and that the lab equipment isn't sort of wandering a little bit. Um, and also some spot checking of samplers in the field. So a couple groups that I work with, especially if it's new samplers, they'll go out and oversee and sort of shadow a new sampler the first few times they're out and then on some lesser schedule after that. Um, so those are all the sorts of things you, you would think about when 
putting together those chapters of your QAP, um, putting those plans down on paper so that lets you put them into action later. Since QAPs are my life, like I love hearing about this stuff. Um, so, and with a, I'm, I'm gonna um, take this opportunity as EPA and a question that's come in through the chat. What can EPA or other local and state organizations, like if you could tell us what would help a lot, let us know. It's your time. Let us know how we can help. Who would like to go? Are you asking the panel? <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, please. Yeah, yeah. I can't, because I can't. I can't talk to the people in the. Oh yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, I'll, I'll just say. I mean, I, I'll say. I would love to see um, structured support, financial support for community organizations in, in EPA funding calls. I mean, a dedicated funding support for that that is realistic with respect to the relationship building and time invested. From, from all parties. And, and it's, 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 it's a hard one to set aside money for, so it's a bit of a pipe dream, but I think there's enough chatter in communities that, that would suggest that this is a need for this to really move forward in a, in a concerted way. Yeah, dedicated and sustained, right? And sustained, uh, yeah. Yeah, who else? Uh, I can certainly come up with a list, uh, but the, sort of the top of my list would be assistance with communication about the standards. When you have a 24 hour PM 2.5 standard and somebody has a five minute value that's scary high, they're very concerned about their health, but the health department won't weigh in on a five minute value. So we need help explaining that risk to the public so that you know, it's not insulting to them or inaccurate scientifically. It's, it's a very difficult balance for us. Thank you. Uh, I, I understand that very much. Jill. Yeah, and in addition to, to Brian's um, suggestion for more funding being infused into these programs, which I entirely agree with, I'd say more tools um, like AquaQuap, but for all, all sorts of environmental monitoring, just things that make the process a little easier on groups, whether it be in developing their QAPs or in actually collecting uh, or sharing their data, you know, something that's easier to contribute data than EPA's WQX, which is very, very confusing um, and over, can be overly technical. So tools that just make their lives easier. <laughs> Thank you. And Sergio, what do you want from us? What do you want from us? <laughs> Well, uh, I think uh, something that will help probably is maybe communication between you know EPA and the state agencies. So there is um, you know a little easier you know because the, as a, the citizens as a citizen group they r rarely are gonna go straight to, to EPA. You know they they are afraid or or they don't have the time whatever. But they usually communicate with the state agency. So if there is a, a good communication between the, the federal EPA and and the states, I think it will help. And yes, provide you know some funding is always good. Uh, although in our case with with the water monitoring, you know most of the groups they they uh, buy their own. Uh, monitoring equipment and that's where the low cost it helps you know, uh, in the beginning you know with funding from epa we you know provided a lot of uh, uh, monitoring supplies to to citizens and when that fund went down uh, many monitors stopped and there were the monitors that so now it's a lot uh, better in a sense that you know if the monitors they put something on the table you know and they have a little help Usually, these monitoring groups go for a long, long term. Well, and I appreciate that too. That um, communication across government levels is really an ongoing challenge, but a worthwhile challenge to solve because it helps us all. So, um, and one other thing is from yesterday's talk, as well as what we were just talking about, data accessibility. So whether it's making it easy to put it into something, to make it easy to share it, to make it easy in terms of formatting, 
all of the things that make whatever has been collected, and we know that it is a sound, good quality data, that it can be used by many. So um, with that, we are just about at the end of our time. I want to, uh, again, uh, reassure people that we're looking at the chat or the, and the question and answers, and we'll try and answer questions that weren't answered during this. Uh, I want to thank our panelists so much, uh, Jill Carr, Brian Nagy, Sergio Ruiz Cordova, and Dirk Felton, as well as uh, CSA and APHL, who made this all happen. Um, this, this was great for me sitting in this chair, so I hope it was for all of you sitting out in your chairs. Um, as a wrap up, there will be APHL will be sending a communication shortly. We'll let you know where, where um, this information will live. So the slides and the, um, and where the recording will be. Um, there may be a survey that comes up. So if you, if you get one of those, please respond. Um, this, again, the recording of this webinar will be available for anyone to access through the Citizen Science Association's YouTube channel. And if you have any additional questions, Sarah Wright at APHL.org is the right person to uh, contact. And with that, thank you again. Thank you so much for participating and uh, have a great day. Thank you everybody.